Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's always a, a, a pleasure to present on the day, and especially the morning right after karaoke, so I can use my deep radio voice. It's very good. Um, we're here to tell you a little bit about Wigma Digital, which is a project we've been working on at the Williams College Museum of Art. My name is Chad Weiner. I'm the manager of digital initiatives at the Williams College Museum of Art. And this is Michael Walter. Um, he is principal at Michael's Walter Studio. Um, uh, yeah, and let me, let me just dive right in. Um, this is an overview of um, how we like to, to see the project as it fits within the museum as a whole. Um, we have the collection there on the right hand side. That's a visualization um, of the entire collection. And you can see a, a, kind of a dynamic group of public and audience facing programs up there on the left. Let's dive in. That collection piece is about 15,000 um, works of art collected over the last um, 60 or 70 years. Uh, it's a collection that's really focused on teaching, so it's a, it's a broad collection. Um, it's deep in, in areas as well. Um, and it's used in really, really interesting ways. Uh, the collection and the collection data that we have has been lovingly cared for and supports um, all of these program areas. Uh, it's a wide range of program areas. The, um, the one thing that I would love to get across um, really quickly is, is how dynamic and innovative uh, Williams College uh, the museum is at using the collection in really interesting ways. Um, I'll highlight just a few of them. One of my favorite examples is the Walls program. This is a program where um, students are encouraged to, to select a work of art from the collection. They bring it home to their dorm room and live with it for a semester. This is the sort of deep um, uh, learning experience that the Williams College Museum of Art is really interested in and really good at. Um, at the end of the semester, they write an entry in a journal that travels with each work of art. Um, uh, the journal entries are sometimes poignant, they're sometimes funny, uh, they're sometimes reflective. Um, they're always written with an eye toward the next person who's going to get that work of art um, uh, as a primer for the experience of living with that work of art down the road. Uh, for us, from a data standpoint, this is a really interesting um, example of qualitative data around works of art. Um, and this is a great picture. Students actually uh, will camp out in the snow uh, to get the work of art that they're most interested in. Um, uh, I graduated from Duke University. We do things like this for basketball games. Yeah. At Williams, it's about works of art. Object Lab is another great example. This is a gallery where faculty members are invited to select five or six works of art from the collection um, that will help them best teach their course for the semester. And the courses are not just art history courses. They're not just history courses. This is a place where the chemistry professor can come in, select works of art that can help them teach certain things within their chemistry class. Uh, another great example of that is the Rose Study Classroom, um, where Williams College Museum of Art staff work directly one-on-one -on -one with faculty members to select works of art and present them to a class in a classroom setting um, for a direct experience with objects uh, teaching a class concept. So in each of these examples, you get a sense of um, not just the museum presenting works of art uh, in an art history context, but eager to present works of art in a neuroscience context in a physics context, in a computer science context. All of these new contexts are not ones that we um, are necessarily familiar with. So they're all opportunities for us as a museum to learn um, new knowledge, new context around our objects. So part of, um, a big part of our idea around this project is to, is to gather that new knowledge, that new context that happens um, as an outgrowth of these programs and bring it back into our collection data. Once it's back into the collection data, we can then uh, discover new ways to share this new context 
And that, re that sharing of the new context allows for even more um, programmatic use. So we can approach that chemistry professor who might be a little hesitant, might not know where to start in using um, works of art for a, a chemistry class. Um, but we can offer a, a selection of works of art that have been used before in chemistry or in neuroscience or by, by his uh, um, uh, other department members um, and have at least a, a starter, um, which help, helps us to, to get those faculty members comfortable with using the collection um, and, and gives them a sense of, of ownership as well. And so this is the cycle that we're, that we're meant to, to encourage um, and through this digital project and data project, um, spur new collection knowledge and new um, program use as well. There are two areas where we're trying to kickstart this cycle as well. Um, one is certainly on the data side. Um, so very early on, we released our collection data set um, as, a, as a new programmatic way to, to um, access the collection. That collection data set, I should say, is available on, on GitHub as a CSV file, as a JSON file. It's a real resource and um, uh, an entry drug conversation, especially with computer science departments, stats, math, um, and others. Um, we found early on that a complete image set, uh, thumbnails of each of the image works of art in the collection, is also really helpful for a stats class, for a faculty member that's interested in, in um, uh, math or computational media. Um, and an outgrowth of both of those is a collection API um, for that uh, is a, a fantastic resource for students, um, uh, even starting out in computer science. So these, these ways of um, the data actually kickstarting, adding to our programmatic ways of, of integrating the collection into the uh, academic field is, um, is already bearing fruit seen in just the last couple semesters, classes embracing um, the data that we've been coming up with. So this is actually a class out uh, in UCLA. So when you post uh, a collection data set up on GitHub, it's of course available to everyone. Um, this Digital Humanities 101 class at UCLA scooped it up and um, groups there use it for data projects. You see on the right, data visualization projects, um, some, some basic uh, artist network mapping, timelines, um, this is, it's, a, it's a great example of, of opening up a collection um, and being more excited by the uses that other, others are making of the collection um, than even uh, your own um, work. This is a human-computer interac interaction class that was, um, it was a relationship inspired by our release of the collection data, um, but the HCI class found the physical spaces of the museum as an ideal teaching place to teach the, the concepts of um, uh, informal learning spaces, uh, even, even at that interface of physical and online spaces. And so this, um, this cycle continues, certainly. Object Lab, we had a stats class in, even last semester, um, considering uh, the concepts of clustering um, and clustering uh, image artifacts in particular. Um, with our image set and with our new data set, this was a possibility. And it was amazing to see these ideas worked out in a gallery setting as well. So one thing in terms of a, of a digital project that I think as museum technologists we rarely have access to is access to an exhibition program. Um, Pink Art was an exhibition based on the ideas that were coming out of Wickma Digital. Um, this was a, a, a gallery exhibition um, where we essentially uh, allowed the galleries to become our visualization space. Other institutions might have giant screens, may have um, the capability of, of doing dynamic visualization. For us, our primary resource is physical gallery space um, and uh, allowing works of art to, to tell the story. So we collaborated with a computer science class, um, tasked five students with ranking the entire collection, again, that image set, by pinkness. And um, each of those, five of the, the student groups,
develop their own algorithm uh, to do that. Each was very idi idiosyncratic, each was uh, uh, bespoke, each had its own perspective and view on the collection. Um, we gathered those uh, and curated an, an exhibition that, that spoke to these different perspectives on the collection. Um, some of the things that, that, that came out of this was a, was, um, a real interaction between um, bringing digital tools as a new perspective on a humanities collection. One of the most interesting aspects of this uh, exhibition, though, um, was that the conversation also went the other way. So what does it mean to bring humanities tools or a cultural heritage collection um, into the space of a computer science class? Um, uh, it was an opportunity to say uh, collection data in particular is a great example of data that is, um, that is textured, that it has been grown over time, that is not clean and pristine, um, and a great lesson for computer science uh, classes that they need to examine each data set. There's no data set that is pure and objective and untainted um, from human hands. And so this idea of using a, a humanities collection as a commentary on digital culture um, was a, a, a unexpected and really interesting conversation that popped up. And it's one too that happened at just the same time as the program committee for this conference was talking about a conference theme. And so it fed into um, the, the theme, which is humanizing the digital, bringing that human element and a human perspective on digital culture. And real quick, I'll try to be, try to zoom through this. We're, we're gonna give um, uh, time for Micah to, to show us the, the nuts and bolts of this as well. We kick-started this also on the data side. So um, uh, this is a, a moment for us to, to develop enhanced data uh, to pull dimensions out of our collections management system, dates in a new way, um, but also think about that deep qualitative data, that WALS program, for instance, that, that I showed you. We have that all in spreadsheets. It's all annotated. It's um, categorized and uh, um, available on an internal basis. And then computer vision data, so a new view into the collection um, using, using um, technical tools. And that just leads onward in the cycle. We did data visualization sprints that allowed us to see our collection in new ways and to share our new findings with curators. Um, so this is some of that use data that we were talking about. These are exhibition counts. The cursor is pointing to a, a Picasso print. I should say this is a view of the entire collection. Um, each uh, work of art is, is a little chip in this diagram. And this shows you parts of the collection that have been used perhaps more than others. This is an event count diagram, same sort of information. This was fascinating to our academic curator. She was able to see which parts of the collection were most used at a glance. Um, things like size of the collection. We had just acquired a new Sam Gilliam piece, by far the largest um, work of art in the collection. Um, and a view of the the different artists and makers in the collection. We're just now hiring a postdoc position to, um, to bring our collection, collection tools, collection data, um, to the faculty as well um, to help us with that interaction, but also to help the faculty members in their own digital projects. We're in a really interesting situation where we at the museum can be that interface between different departments. Um, it, it's, a, it's a natural uh, for a, an art museum at Williams College to, to be that intermediary and the home of digital humanities in a way. And our next step is an, on an enhanced online collection. So we'll take some of the, the lessons that we've learned from um, our visualization sprints and apply that into an into a online format where we can point faculty members um, and they can have a, a, a deep dive, a visual browsing experience um, into the collection uh, augmented by this new used data. <laughs> and 
that's what I got. Do you want to hook in here? How was karaoke last night? <laughs> I was there. I will try another dongle. This is live demo time, so you know if it's going to happen. three-year grant-funded project. We're in year two, um, and uh, that's where I am as well. So, William, you've only been doing these kind of programs for two years? Well, the, the academic programs have been going on. Um, the the student-faculty interaction um, uh, have been a hallmark of Williams College Museum of Art. Um, and so this digital project was really meant to capitalize on what the museum was already really good at and gathering some of the data from those activities. Yeah. Cool. Um, thanks, for John. <laughs> third, third dongle worked. All right, so um, I don't have slides. This is going to be a little messy. I'm just going to kind of show you things uh, that, and talk a little bit about the project itself. Uh, we started working with Chad and Wixma what, like six months ago maybe, a little longer than that. Um, and what I found really interesting about WICMA and specifically about working with Chad is that they're, they're really open to doing a lot of things out in the open. Uh, they have a very small technical staff, which is Chad, uh, and a volunteer who's a retired IT person who just offers his assistance, <laughs> who's, a, who's actually really awesome and clever. Uh, so we really needed to think about how to approach this project so that we could build something really complex with uh, really simple parts. Um, so we do everything open, out in the open on GitHub. Uh, Chad had already released the collection data here, as you can see. All of our code is available, um, open source for anyone to see, uh, and really well documented. That's kind of something we've tried to really think about is that later on, after we're done with this project, they might hire a developer or another firm to come in, and we really want them to be able to uh, get under the hood and turn screws and evolve the, pl the platform. So feel free to take a look. This kind of outlines how it all works. It's meant to be able for anyone to sort of spin up and start their own instance of this. Um, but let me take a look at this diagram here that sort of explains how everything fits together. So on the left, there are various sources of information. Uh, and for this project, that means TMS. Um, but it also means Excel spreadsheets and Google Docs. Uh, and other things we haven't thought about yet. The point is there's all sorts of data sources that are sort of the source of truth for all the, uh, all the information that Wickham is collecting through its use of the collection. Uh, we have this idea of a dashboard, which I'll show you in, in a moment. Uh, of course, there's the API, which is the nerdy part. Uh, there's an authentication layer, which I'll explain too, which is really stupidly simple. Uh, and then we have another database that we create to sort of uh, store all this information and make it very searchable. We, we use Elasticsearch for that. Um, so data comes in, it goes into this database uh, and becomes searchable through this API. We also have uh, image hosting. Um, they didn't have a digital asset management system, uh, so we found a really simple solution for that that I'll show you in a moment as well. And then there are outputs, and that's what we're working on now in this next phase. As, as Chad mentioned, we're building a, a way to explore the collection through its data. Um, but this could actually be a lot of other things, uh, like apps or other uh, projects that Chad and Wickman decide to do in the future. Uh, 
So that's how it's all wired together. It's actually really simple. Um, and I'm going to give you a little quick tour of the dashboard. Actually, that's that Sam Gilliam piece, isn't it, right there yeah. Yeah, in the background? So whenever you go to the dashboard, you get a new random image back there because that's fun. Um, and of course, you can log. So this is all public, by the way. Um, parts of it are public, parts of it are private. Um, I'm going to log in as myself, so you'll see everything. So um, don't tweet the keys and everything. Uh, but we use a system called Auth0 to um, authenticate. Uh, Auth0 is a really simple tool that lets people, uh, you, so you can log in with things like Twitter and Google or, or your email address. I'm going to use Twitter. Uh, and it basically gives us a little database of users uh, and it allows us to easily authenticate with uh, the system. Uh, if you're a new developer coming to this platform, once you uh, log in, you get minted an API token. Uh, and that's just your password or your key to be able to use the API. And if you're a developer, what you might mainly see is documentation about how to use the API. So I can take, show you that. Uh, so this explains how the API works. Uh, it's basically a tutorial. Uh, it teaches you a little bit about what GraphQL is. GraphQL is just the technology we use for how the API works or is structured. Uh, there's a single endpoint, and then you can make all kinds of queries uh, as many as you want. Um, so this is a sort of hello world sanity check type of a query. Uh, but then in the, in the documentation, we also give um, examples of how to run this in your terminal uh, or how to run it uh, in code. So we use Node.js to sort of give you an example of how to make that call. And we've got your API token pasted right in there. So you can just copy and paste this into your um, text editor and, and run it really quickly. And the idea here is to really enable people who are new to the API to get started as quickly as possible. Because uh, oftentimes these are students or uh, people in Los Angeles or whatever who are just really curious about getting and, and want to get their feet wet and see what the API can do. Um, as well, there is also this thing called the GraphQL Playground, uh, which is something that comes for free with GraphQL. Uh, there's actually not a whole lot of setup involved, and it really it just allows people to play with the API uh, right in the browser. So I'm going to show you that here in a second. Uh, so if you find an example piece here, like a just a information about objects query, you can click Run in the Playground, and that should take you over to this Playground thing, uh, where you can create your own queries here on the left. Can everyone see that? I can make it a little bit bigger, uh, and then you can run them. So I just ran this query, which is just give me all the object IDs, and it just gives them to you over here on the right. Uh, I can modify that to add things like uh, title kind of correct to you as you type. So now this adds uh, titles of objects. Uh, and you can get more complicated, like adding uh, makers. And it just we're just adding more and more data to uh, the response. And what's really nice about this is that as a developer, you can really customize your queries uh, so that you only get back the information you need rather than everything that, that we might know about, uh, which is really handy for things like mobile devices and that, and that sort of stuff. Uh, if you don't know what's available, of course, there's sort of like a type ahead kind of thing here. So if I to start typing, uh, what's another one? Medium. Yeah, I, it shows me what, what's available, like that. It just gives me more responses. But then there's also documentation right here in line. So I can click on here and see all the different things I can query. Um, so you can see there is information about objects available. There are makers or artists, um, periods, mediums, exhibitions, um, and events, which is one of the things that Chad mentioned is really unique to this project. So we're, we're also making available information about events that have happened uh, at, at Whitmer. So let me jump back out here. As you go down to the documentation, it gets more and more complicated, more complex queries. So here's one that we'll try out that basically gives you all kinds of information about an object. It also paginates that for you. So we want four objects per page, and this is page 10. And it brings up all the information about that object, as well as the, uh, the information about the images uh, that are available. Uh, so let me jump over for a moment and show you how images work. So I, like I mentioned, we didn't have a digital asset management system available. As I'm sure a lot of you know, those things can be expensive uh, and complicated to roll out. Uh, so we went with a really 
what I call the simplest, dumbest thing answer for uh, a digital asset management system, which is a service called uh, Cloudinary. Uh, and we're actually still using the free plan, I think, <laughs> uh, which is great. So um, we have over 17,000 uh, artworks in the system. Uh, and what's really cool about Cloudinary is that it's really meant for developers rather than uh, a cataloging tool. So we have a system in the background that uploads all these images into Cloudinary and keeps them uh, refreshed. And then you can go in and take a look at them, um, but this is actually really just for us to see. You can uh, resize them, you can uh, modify them in different ways, but more, more importantly, you get URLs, right? So it tells you uh, how to reference these things in your code. Uh, and what I think is really fun to show around Cloudinary is that it also does a lot of uh, image processing stuff that's really handy on the web. Uh, so these ideas of transformation. So if you upload an image that's, let's say, 1,000 pixels by 1,000 pixels, it'll create transformations for you on the fly. Maybe. Uh, oh, I'll pop, 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 really? Live demo, always allow. Cool. Uh, oh, so there's a really tiny one. Uh, so it, it automatically uh, resizes those images based on the Im information that you put right here in the URL. I know it's really hard to see, but I can put in, let's say, 400. Oops, I did it wrong. Just one second. So I, if I change the width here to 400 and the height to 500, uh, it should give me back a bigger image. Uh, and it does all sorts of other things, like you can uh, do I think some image recognition. It'll give you like round thumbnails if you want, or thumbnails with corners rounded off, all sorts of cool transformations, all basically for free. It's really simple to set up and use. And there's really not a lot of configuration here. Uh, and the thing that I think was really important with this project was to piece these things together in a way that wasn't a big burden for the project itself, because what we were really interested in this project was the data itself. So uh, let me go back to the dashboard. Where's that? That's here. So in addition to all the documentation around the, how to use the API, the dashboard is also Wickham's tool for managing the API. Uh, so there's an area here called configuration. Uh, this is the part you're not supposed to tweak. Or to, to, to tweak. So um, this is where all those systems are connected together. So uh, there's the endpoint for the actual API, which is called GraphQL, uh, and they can go, we won't change this now, but that will break everything. Uh, and then here's the connection to Elasticsearch, uh, Spelunker, something else I'll talk about in a moment. Here's, of course, our connection to TMS. They have the eMuseum API, so we sort of leverage that as a way to pull data from TMS into our system. Uh, and then you can add other TMSs if there's, for some reason, more than one. Uh, here's our connection to Cloudinary, so you get the idea. This is how we sort of do all the plumbing behind the scenes to make this whole thing work. Uh, in addition to that, we also have a stats and search page. And so this is still internal to Wickma. Um, this kind of gives you an overview of what's in the API and what's happening on a daily basis because it updates every night as curators are changing things in TMS. Uh, so it shows you how many objects there are in the system, how many of them have images, how many were uploaded last night or changed. Uh, and then of course you can search uh, for objects, search for number 42. And this is, I think, a really interesting tool. Uh, this shows you the current status of that object in the API. Uh, so you can see this is what we took out of TMS in JSON format. Uh, this is some extra information that we've pulled in from a different part of TMS. Uh, this is what the image looks like and this is some color information that was processed about that image. This is what it looks like once it's into Elasticsearch. So you're starting to get the idea. We're just basically offering a page that allows um, Wickman staff to verify what's, what was the source of truth and how it wound up in our system. Uh, we can go on. It, it just kind of goes on and on. Uh, you can also search in here for events. Let's search for event 42. And so same thing. You get back just basically the raw data about that particular event. Uh, and you can see that this was a class session. It shows you the objects that were used in that class. So as Chad mentioned, uh, they hold classes across the entire university that use collection objects to sort of start a dialogue about that class. 
and they've recorded all the objects that were referenced, and so we have that data here. And so you can just sort of verify that it's there. Uh, what else does it do? There's an area here called upload JSON files. So like I mentioned, there's TMS as one major source of truth, but there's also Excel spreadsheets and XML files and all kinds of different things. Um, and this is an area where you can manually up, update those things. Uh, so it's doing all these things behind the scenes on a nightly basis, but they can also sort of intervene and jump in here and upload those things uh, whenever they need to. Uh, but this is where they would upload uh, a new TMS JSON file or uh, the events data, that kind of thing. And the idea here is that we're gonna continue to add to this as we discover new data sets and as we start to unpack them and figure out their relevance in the API. Um, of course, there's other basic stuff, like there's an admin area, so I can, I can minister, uh, I can destroy everything, we won't do that. Uh, and if that happens, by the way, it'll just regenerate the next day, so that's, that's what that is. Uh, but we can administer users, so um, here's, here's me, there's Chad. Uh, and so I have, there's different roles built in, so I'm an admin, but you know, as a, if you signed up for this right now, you would be marked as a developer, and so we can kind of promote you based on uh, your relationship with the museum. Uh, and yeah, that's kind of it. It's basically a, a way to monitor what's going on behind the scenes in a really simple kind of a way. Uh, that's it, that's all I got. So I think we just have a discussion now. Have, I know we're, we're, we went a little bit long. Do we, do we have <laughs> questions? Yeah. I already asked them here. Uh, so this dashboard, is that completely custom? Is this what you guys figured? Yes. Yes, okay. It's, yes, mostly. So <laughs> the dashboard bit is all custom. Uh, it's built in uh, Node.js uh, and what else? GraphQL. Uh, but all the other important pieces that I showed are pretty much turnkey off the shelf, like Cloudinary, we just signed up, right? And Auth0, which, which is our uh, user authentication service, same kind of thing, you just sort of sign up and configure it. Uh, so that's the idea with it. The, the core piece of the, of, the, of the project is custom, uh, but all the uh, heavy lifting is done through uh, off the shelf services. I should say too, um, one of my favorite parts of this project is how closely we were able to work with um, our registrars. So it's lovely to have Rachel here, our associate registrar. Um, it's, it's, it's been rare in my experience to have such close collaboration between, um, we actually have Jim, who volunteered at first now, is a part-time um, uh, uh, developer, collection developer for us. And to see the, the teamwork between um, core collections information and uh, developers is, has been fantastic. Yes? It's a good segue to my question, which is about the sustainability of the project, since it's a three-year grant-funded project and you're a vendor, so how are you planning for staff to like continue this? Right, it's a great question. Um, that is, is part of the reason we brought in a collection developer for that sustainability. Mm -hmm. The postdoc um, hire is also part of that sustainable thinking. Um, but even our choices in terms of architecture um, were ones that were informed by, um, as Micah said, the, the ability of a, for us to, to hand that off to a, um, a junior level developer um, in a way that, that would make sense to them. Um, and uh, uh, I think certainly as we, as we move forward, that will be the, the kind of thinking um, that we roll through. Yeah. I think that that's the sort of opportunity that this kind of project opens up. We wanted to start with the academic data um, because that that is an area where we were we were sensing this context and knowledge. You know, when the neuroscience professor uses that work of art, that that we felt like we had to gather right now um, because otherwise it would be lost. But you're totally right. Every time a work of art goes through to the digitization studio. 
every time it goes to conservation. These are all events in the life of an object. Um, and this sort of model of collection information is one that um, uh, is attuned to those events um, and tracking the life of a, of a work of art. Um, and that's the, that's the potential. Um, and some of it is, is pretty low hanging fruit. Yeah, yeah. Are you seeing at this point <coughs> any sort of feedback yeah. you would get to the folks who are managing the data that you have access to where you're bringing requirements back to them and saying, hey, you know, if you did this to your data, it might be cleaner, I might be able to ask more questions, uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, do you um, want to answer? Yeah, um, it's just been really helpful to have. You know, Jim Allison, who's our developer, um, I, we sit actually right next to each other. <laughs> and um, I often, or he'll oftentimes ask me, like, where is this? Like, <laughs> you know, where's this data? And I've had the luxury of being from the inception of our TNS database. Um, I kind of helped build it. Um, we had actually started on Argus and converted to TMS back in 2009. And so um, I was one of the first people to actually put data in. So I kind of have a unique um, <laughs> yeah. perspective where I, I know where all the data is. And we've been pretty systematic in our thinking. Um, and because there's only been like maybe two people who have any say in where anything goes, <laughs> We were pretty nimble and flexible, um, and we definitely have taken advice from Chad um, and also our developer. Yep. Yep. It's been really like, you know, you shouldn't do that. <laughs> like, yep. Yep. You know, like you don't want to do that. And, and, and I would say too, even as we released the data, as you know, that first data set went out, we released it probably too soon um, because I was eager to get feedback on it. And so when a class uses it, and they say, oh, this is good, but wouldn't it be great if we had this? We can come back and say, can we get that? And, and we can. Yeah, and Jim, he has the capability of moving. Like, I can actually tell him, the data right now is here. I want it over here. Mm -hmm. So he has the ability to move things, which is really helpful. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Any other quick questions? I'll be around all day. Um, thank you very much for coming.